Okay, welcome back everyone. I'm here with a very special guest. He is um, a older brother disciple of mine and someone I've known for the last 20 years uh, as I've been coming to Center for Spiritual Awareness. Uh, his name is Ron Lindon and he's the senior minister here at Center for Spiritual Awareness now. So thank you for being here, Ron. Good, thank you. Yeah. And one of the reasons I wanted to do this uh, this discussion is because number one, I know that you're working on an interesting movie related to uh, Yogananda and the Guru lineage. Number two, even though I've seen you often and interacted with you throughout all these years coming to CSA, um, I really don't have much of an idea of number one, how you showed up here at CSA, how long you've known Roy, and um, just what your what your what your process was. So how did you first come to hear about Kriya Yoga and how did you come to CSA? Okay, well, I, I, I wasn't looking for anything. A lot of people come to their spiritual path because things are not working, they're suffering, they have challenges, and, and I was, I, I've been very blessed. So I was just having the normal, young, California lifestyle um, working away and I had just been promoted to taking over the photographic department at Westinghouse in Sunnyvale which is a huge, you know, 3,000 employees, 80 acres and the photographic department was me. Right. So, so they, they put me in this position uh, which was wonderful, wonderful opportunity and one of the first people to come through the door to get a picture taken was a man named Arlie Gaines. Oh, okay. And Arlie Gaines was a technical writer at the company, mm -hmm. and he wanted a picture that had nothing to do with the company. He wanted a picture for a poster because he was going to teach a meditation class. Okay. And so, and I said, sure, I'll be glad to take your picture. And what year was this about? 1970. Okay. So this was uh, in the fall of 1970, and uh, so it, in the process, you know, we started talking about meditation, which I knew nothing about. So I said, what is this meditation? How's that different from self-hypnosis? And, um, and he invited me to come to his study group. So he was Roy's um, uh, center man. He was his representative in San Jose okay. uh, and had been for several years. And he had a study group in his house every Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. So he invited me to come and he gave me one of Roy's books. The first one I read was How You Can Use Your Creative Imagination. Mm -hmm. And I read that and I said, of course, you know, this <laughs> makes so much sense. Why don't they teach us this in school? And so I began to attend Arlie's class and also, you know, besides other times, um, we would have chances to talk. And every day we would meet together for lunch and go meditate. So we'd spend our 30 minute lunch break, 20 minutes would be meditating, and then 10 minutes we'd, you know, wolf down the lunch. So he was at Westinghouse too? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, he was a technical writer. Mm -hmm. And so every Tuesday night, unless it was Christmas or Thanksgiving, uh, you know, we were always there. And then when Roy came to town, Roy had just had just actually just been there. I just missed him in uh, in September, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so I re started reading his books, and I wrote to him. We started corresponding, and then uh, San Jose was always very good for Roy, so he would be there twice a year. Mm -hmm. So he would come back in the spring. So he came back in April. And because I was very close to Arlie, and we were, you know, working together and spending a lot of time, uh, I helped. I volunteered to help out on with the book table. And uh, Roy's first talk in, 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 that, in that tour was in San Francisco at the Metaphysical Bookstore. So I remember the first time I actually met him. Mm -hmm. I'd gone to the lecture, heard the lecture, and then afterwards he was meeting people around the book table and. And um, and I said, uh, you know, I went up and introduced myself, and mm -hmm. and I expected him to go, oh, we finally, you know, we get a chance to meet, and he goes, oh, nice to know you, and then goes <laughs> to the next person, and and uh, but then uh, a few days later, he was down in San Jose for a, a 
two-day program at Los Gatos Lodge, and so we had a chance to talk more and meet more, and and that's when he agreed to be my guru, okay. my teacher, and uh, and that was also the week where I was initiated. <coughs> okay. So, were we still in 1970, or have we gone past 1970? We're in the spring of of 71. Okay. <coughs> so, and so then. Uh, by 72, Arlie was kind of like a drill sergeant. Um, not only was he keeping us, you know, focused on our meditation and, and uh, uh, studying yoga, Kriya Yoga, um, Patanjali, Bhagavad Gita, and, but he, by, by 72, he was encouraging me to go out and talk. Okay. Teach meditation classes. He says, "There's we need we need more teachers, and there's lots of things to do." And and I couldn't I couldn't stand up in front of four people and talk without my <laughs> <laughs> wobbling and sweaty palms. And so so I went and took a night school class in public speaking. And after I don't know the third or the fourth class, they had the. the the teacher had given us a couple of suggestions and it was like all of a sudden it clicked and it's like, okay, I can do that. Mm -hmm. And so I started going out and teaching meditation for 7th Street Spiritualist Church and, you know, any group that, ne that needed a teacher. So mm -hmm. I was going all over uh, the South San Francisco Bay Area. And eventually San Quentin, I went into San Quentin and taught the prisoners and so that was happening. And then, uh, what was it, 1975, Arlie was transferred to Iran. Oh, okay. Um, as a technical writer for Westinghouse, but they, they, there were projects that they were working on. And so because he left, I took over the study group. Okay. So starting in 1975, the study group moved to my house, and so we had every, the Tuesday night groups we were always at Ron's house. And then I continued to serve as the representative for Roy, mm -hmm. so setting up arrangements for when he would come out twice a year for retreats and programs. And so that was 75. And then by 77, uh, in the fall of 77, I picked him up at the airport. And on the way back to San Jose, I said, you know, I've decided to quit my job. <laughs> Um, I've done everything with photography you can do, every kind of camera, and it's and I don't want to be working at this company for 25 more years. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to continue to grow, and everybody loves me, and we're getting along, and it's a great job, and it's a good time to go out on a high note. <laughs> right. So I had decided that the, the, the following summer I would go look for another job and do something that was, you know, continued to be challenging. Mm -hmm. And so he said, well, why don't you come back and work with me? Hmm. I said, wow, you know, this is, what a great opportunity, mm -hmm. you know. And I mean, I'm obviously I'm called to this ministry, and I feel like it's an important part of my life, but how do you know unless you do it? Mm -hmm. so, so I thought, wow, this is really super opportunity. And at the same time, I thought, there's no way. Mm -hmm. Because I've got you know this responsibility. I have a house and a dog and two motorcycles and a car and a wife and um, and a very busy, busy lifestyle. And you know it was very interesting. So and I thought I, I just don't know how this could possibly work. <clears throat> but when I came home that night, and we were sitting around having dinner with my wife. Uh, my, I mean, just my wife and I, mm -hmm. and I said, you never guess what Roy said on the way back from the airport. Um, and she said, well, if that's what you really want to do, let's do it. Hmm. <laughs> so it's like, this is, you know, an invitation from the universe. And so I made arrangements, gave my boss six months notice. Uh, and they put me on a special project to spend a lot of their money on a new system for this video system for this for the company, mm -hmm. and uh, and then you know when the time came, it was in the in the fall night of the next year, mm -hmm. 1978. Uh, sold everything, had a had a garage sale, and it was scheduled to start at 
nine o'clock on Friday morning on my <laughs> last day of work, and my wife was home to take care of it. An hour before the uh, garage sale, somebody showed up and bought everything. Everything. <laughs> That's it was interesting. like, I mean, there's <laughs> nothing left. Motorcycles including, too. Including my car. Oh, I gave, including my car. gave my motorcycles to my brother and, okay. and the dog to the kids across the street <laughs> and uh, packed up a few belongings in a little 14 foot U Haul truck. Mm and drove across country and landed here at CSA. Hmm. Well. So, <laughs> so that was 1978. Yeah. And when I when I left to come here, I had absolutely no idea what I was going to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, just this was the opportunity to come and participate. And so that, would, that became a new interesting adventure. So did you stay on the grounds or did you have a place to stay? Yeah, no, it, uh, in those days we had uh, some double wide mobile homes that okay. were where the guest houses now are. Okay, right. So the lower one down here was my house. So okay. I, I lived here for five years. Hmm. Okay. And worked. So it's like 82 or 83, something like that? Until yeah. 83, yeah. Okay. From 78 to 83. And when I got here, it was in the fall in August, and we had a retreat, uh, like two weeks, I think, after I arrived. Mm -hmm. And there was a fellow here who had been here with Roy for almost a year, Sam Sasu mm -hmm. from Ghana. And so at this first retreat, Roy called Sam and I up to the front and ordained us both as ministers. Mm -hmm. So I didn't see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> and that when we hadn't talked about this, but this was uh, this was his way of doing things. Right. So so I was ordained as a minister, and in those days, uh, the Sunday morning programs were uh, half an hour of meditation and a half an hour of teaching. Okay. So there'd be a you know a talk sharing, and Roy was on the road a lot. I mean, he was still traveling to about 50 cities every year. Hmm. Um, so he was on the road ha at least half the time. So when he was on the road, then uh, the other minister who was here with me, David Sunday, okay. David had come out a year before me, but he was part of our group in California. Mm -hmm. um, so David Sunday and I would take turns doing the Sunday services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then also programs, and I was... Um, Started going, uh, serving Unity churches in the area, so down in Gainesville and up in Franklin and over in Asheville, and so I was traveling to to do talks for them on Sundays as well as working here. Mm -hmm. Well, since I've known you, you've always been doing design work and audiovisual stuff. So has that been what you've been doing? The entire time uh, for CSA, aside from the ministry portion of it. Well, my yeah, my background was, you know, I had, uh, I was doing not only still photography, but also we started doing training films, and that was 16 millimeter when I started. And mm -hmm. by the time I left, video had started. Industrial video was available, so, so yeah, I started doing uh, videos of Mr. Davis when I came here. Mm -hmm. Actually, I was doing them out in California when he would travel out there so we have we do have some yeah. video of him back in the early 70s throughout the 70s um, that I was able to do um, so yeah I did I did video but the first the first thing I had to do when I got here was to work in the printing plant mm -hmm. um, there was a printing printing business that was part of CSA sort of a separate department within CSA and it was the profit department that was supposed to be generating extra funds for the ministry mm -hmm. um, but it was kind of something that, that Roy had inherited when he when he took over as the you know the teaching center mm -hmm. and the folks that had run that had set up the printing business uh, were really sweet people but they weren't very good business people. Mm -hmm. So the printing business was about a hundred thousand dollars in debt. Oh, okay. And it was filled to the to the to the ceiling with jobs to do that were all uh, bid out at very low prices. So, right. so the first thing I did was I they taught me how to run a little printing press, mm -hmm. and I was running the printing press and printing 
all of Roy's materials, you know, the, stu the uh, uh, lessons and whatever we needed printed from here. So I printed all that and then and then also worked on the projects that the printing company had, mm -hmm. uh, which mostly were uh, report card folders for mm -hmm. a million report card folders for schools all over the southeast. It was crazy. <laughs> um, and uh, and also working in the back in the department here that was preparing books. Everything was done manually back then, so we had to take big galleys and cut them up and paste them on pages and photograph them and strip them onto plates and lots of lots of stuff. So I was working, working mm -hmm. uh, as well as taking pictures for Roy. And then the fellow who was. Um, in charge of the printing business uh, retired mm -hmm. and so for a time Roy put me in charge and so now I'm running the, running the printing shop okay. and, and bidding out uh, uh, new jobs and taking care of the employees and mm -hmm. so that was did you reverse the debt no I well I was make, we were making a profit but, <laughs> yeah. but we weren't making a profit anywhere near fast enough to make up the difference right. so and Roy said and every morning we would meet up in his office and talk about this and then get to work. Uh, and he said, you know, this is really a distraction. This has nothing to do with the ministry and we need to just get rid of this printing business mm -hmm. and sell it. And eventually that was what happened. They sold the, sold all the equipment and the business to somebody with the understanding they would move it off the property mm -hmm. within six months or something. And right. So that... Right, that happened, but it was wasn't until eighty three or so. Okay, and you're also um, you're also a unity minister. No, no, no. I'm a CSA minister. I know you're a CSA minister, but you talk at a unity church. Yeah, I had a I talk at lots of unity churches. Okay, and, I, and we had a unity church here that was uh, started in nineteen eighty six by a licensed unity teacher. Okay. And when she started, she asked me if I would come and help her. Okay. She used to come to the to the programs, the Sunday mornings here at CSA. Okay. So she asked me if I would come and help her, and you know she was very sweet and in a beautiful location. And so I said yes. And so for about thirty years, I served as the the co-founder and spiritual leader of the Unity Church in Dillard. Okay, I see. So not a Unity minister, CSA minister. CSA you minister. You were just serving at a Unity Church. But I was serving at the Unity Church. Okay, yeah. okay. And so then that means that you've been in this realm of activity for what, about 50 years now? Well, 45. 45? Least, yeah. Long time, yeah. Well, I've been with actually with Roy for, yeah, 49 years since right. I met Roy. Hmm. Well... I can't even imagine what you've learned <laughs> in that time. <laughs> Can you summarize it? <laughs> Is that what I've learned? Yeah. yeah, mind your own business. That's a <laughs> That's good. Full time job. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> hmm. Well let's let's talk about uh the project that you're on with um the movie. Mm -hmm. So I've I've briefly heard you talk peripherally about it. Um, can you tell me a little bit about what it is you're up to, first off? Well, in 2015, I was inspired to go back to India. I had been there in, in 1981. Um, so I wanted to go back and do a pilgrimage and go to all the places that were relative to Paramahansa Yogananda and our guru lineage. And so my wife and I decided, you know, this would be a fun project. Mm -hmm. And because... I'm a photographer and a, you know, compulsively creative and video person, and so I thought, well, in my research about going to all these places, I couldn't find anybody that had done a pilgrimage video of all the places relative to Yogananda. Mm -hmm. There were little pieces here and there, but no, there wasn't anything that was really, you know, comprehensive. So I thought, well, if we're going to make the trip, we might as well make it worthwhile. Right. So we're going to take a video camera or a couple of video cameras and and plan our trip so that we can get to all these places and videotape and, mm -hmm. and be able to bring that back and share it. So this is how it started. Mm -hmm. 
And in the process, and, and so we went to every place, in the process of visiting these places, I started to get some uh, deeper understanding, deeper insight as to who our gurus really were, who the, the individuals in our guru lineage, who they actually were and, and their relationships and things just sort of started to reveal themselves in the process. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. So we were uh, scheduled to go visit Babaji's cave. This is up near Dwarahat in, uh, uh, in the foothills of the Himalayas, uh, not too far from Raniket. And so we had gone to um, Haridwar and Rishikesh and then made our way over to um, Raniket and Dwarahat. And so we're going to visit Babaji's cave, and we were supposed to go, the way this happens is the key to the cave, they actually have a, a locked door on okay. Babaji's cave now, of course. Um, so the key it, it resides with the YSS, the Yagoda Satsanga ashram in Dwarahat. So you go ask the monk, and uh, my wife has volunteered. She lived there for a, a while and volunteered, so she knows those people. So they had made arrangements for us to have a jeep to take us up to the close, as close as you can get to the cave before you have to hike uh, on the next morning. So this was all arranged and we're set to go. And our plan was to go early in the morning, hike up, visit Babaji's cave, and in the afternoon on the way back, not very far from Babaji's cave is a temple, ancient, ancient temple on Dunagiri Mountain. Dunagiri Temple is one of the 19, I think, most sacred uh, sites in India to Divine Mother. So we thought, well, well, we'll get both of these because they're, you know, on the same trip. So we get up the next morning and get ready to go and there's 25 people from uh, Calcutta who have showed up overnight and they're all going to Babaji's cave. So now instead of our trip being our <laughs> little trip, we are now tacked on to the end of this big you know, caravan of stuff, uh -huh. people. So it's okay, you know, we're, we're flexible. <laughs> So, and they all have, you know, they've made all their arrangements and they're all traveling together and they have their lunch set and all this. And so we're just like kind of riding along with the group. And, uh, and it's because it's such a big group, it's a little complicated and takes more time. And it's quite a hike, quite a strenuous hike from as far as you can drive in to get up to where Babaji's cave is. Um, so anyway, it ends up that by the time we get go through the process and go visit and meditate, have lunch, and come back, uh, it's too late to go visit the Dunagiri Temple. And Dunagiri Temple is about, I don't know, maybe four or five miles from Babaji's cave, and it's another ten miles to get back to Dwarah. So it's quite it's a it's a, a little excursion. So we missed the Dunagiri Temple, and I uh, went back to the ashram, and we had planned to stay there for a few days anyway, so um, so they arranged to have a jeep take us back to the Dunagiri Temple the next day. Mm -hmm. So we go back, and and there's uh, 300 steps, uh, like a kilometer climb up to go to the temple. Beautiful, it's all covered, bells all the way along, and it's quite exotic. And you get up to the temple, and just before the last little part of the climb, you know, 30, 40 feet, there's a big tree on the right, and around the tree is a little wall, and inside the wall is a, there's an opening. Inside the wall, there's flowers and incense burning, and this little altar, this little sanctuary. And on the side of it, there's a sign that says, this is where Babaji and Lahiri Mahashaya would meet and where Babaji would teach Lahiri. Hmm. <laughs> so, so I'm looking at this and I think, well, why would Babaji be here? I mean, why would Babaji be in this area? Uh -huh. 
the only reason to be in this area is to be at this temple. Mm -hmm. This is a really juicy, very, you know, you can feel the energy. So this is what attracted Babaji. Why would Lahiri Mahashaya be hiking and, and uh, you know, if, and find his way to this place? He was a clerk. Mm -hmm. He was a clerk for the military. The military was building a new fort, a new uh, center up in the mountains. Um, many reasons, but um, his job, I mean, their, their job was building roads and taking care of supplies. And he's a clerk. He can, he's very uh, adept with many languages, and he can communicate. So his job is, he's traveled all the way up there just to let the home center know what's happening. Right. So he has a lot of time on his hands, you know, when he's not writing letters. Mm -hmm. And so... So if he's going out to explore, where is he going to go? Well, there's this Dunagiri temple. It's this amazing sacred place. So he would naturally be wanting to be checking this out. Babaji would naturally wanting to be, be wanting to spend time at this. This is where they met. Mm -hmm. You see, uh -huh. there's no question in my mind that this is, you know, this th th this happened. Uh, where Bob, where they say Babaji's cave, Babaji's cave was. Um, you know, is what it was decided after the fact. It, you know, Babaji didn't actually have real estate, and right. there was no original address there. So this was decided in the '60s later on that this was Babaji's cave, and there's some question about whether what's normally thought of as Babaji's cave is really it, or mm -hmm. there's another, a little bit harder to get to and much harder to get into place that. No, that some say that's really Babaji's cave, but this one's easy, so. Right. <laughs> so, um, so Babaji's cave is halfway up this mountain called Pandakola Mountain. Mm -hmm. Pandakola is from the Pandava brothers. Mm -hmm. So in the Bhagavad Gita, the Pandava brothers were sent into exile for 12 years plus one year. Mm -hmm. Where they went in exile is supposed to be this mountain. So okay. the top of this mountain, Pendicola, is where Babaji's cave is, and it's right around the rim. The mountain range kind of has a rim, a U-shaped rim, and it's right around the rim from Dunagiri Temple. Mm -hmm. So Dunagiri Temple's here, Pendicola Mountain, Babaji's cave, mm -hmm. all in the same area. Mm -hmm. So these were the kinds of things that I was observing when I was there, and going, ah, oh, this... Mm -hmm. You know, this makes perfect sense. And then we go back and then start reading about the stories. And, um, you know, of course, there are stories in Autobiography of a Yogi. And some of what I found doesn't, uh, it isn't exactly the same as what Yogananda wrote. Mm -hmm. and so I thought, and somebody, and I was doing a little talk on this, and somebody said, you mean Yogananda was lying <laughs> in his autobiography? I've heard See, Indians tend to <coughs> exaggerate things a bit. <laughs> well, anybody does. I mean, <laughs> Yogananda was was very uh, adept at using the media and at using. I mean, look at the at the titles that he came up with for his talks. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so he knew very much what would sell and right. what was interesting to people. And the stories that he got, much of the, many of these stories were secondhand. Mm -hmm. He went he went back to India. When he traveled back to India, he was doing research for the book that he was writing, mm -hmm. which was the Yogi Christs of India. Mm -hmm. That was originally autobiography of a yogi, and that that's what became later became okay. autobiography of a yogi. But he'd been working on this book for some time, mm -hmm. and he was telling stories about these great yogis in India, and many of the stories were secondhand, thirdhand stories mm -hmm. that you know. You know the telephone game, yeah. right? Um, so it wasn't like he had fact checked all this, and, and and you know had somebody doing research. No, he would talk to people and make notes, and then come back and tell the story, and then then this, and then his writing um, was heavily influenced by Laurie Pratt. Mm -hmm. So Laurie Pratt was a very literate lady, very amazing, you know technician with the language 
And if you read the autobiography of a yogi, and then you read letters that we have of Yogananda writing to his students and disciples, it's not the same. Mm -hmm. Yogananda didn't have that facility with the English language that's in the autobiography. That was Laurie. Yeah. So, so stories were told to Yogananda, mm -hmm. and then Yogananda, you know, interpreted those and told those to Laurie. Mm -hmm. He would dictate. And these, the, the dictation was then transcribed, you know, they take shorthand, then the transcripts were then given to Laurie, and Laurie would sit there and write it up as a story. Mm -hmm. So what we have in, in much of the autobiography was, you know, this it, stories of stories, mm -hmm. and, and not accurate uh, historical facts, but rather this is, you know, generally what happened and the general feeling and the tone. Right. And so, and so, and but, but I found that by actually doing some of the research that we have available now and looking at uh, other texts, there were many people that were writing about what was going on at the time mm -hmm. um, besides Yogananda. And so, so looking at the variety of stories and comparing, um, it, it's not really difficult to be able to sort of intuit, well, this is what's really happening, and this is, you know, the way this unfolded. And mm -hmm. so, Well, I, I want to stay on point, but just everything that you brought up brings up something that comes up a lot. And that is, um, while well, Autobiography of a Yogi is very inspirational, and it's what got me interested in, in Kriya Yoga, um, you know, oftentimes people get so hung up on how fantastic those stories are, sometimes it seems to me that they kind of miss the point of the teachings behind mm -hmm. maybe the morals of the stories. So maybe you've thought about it. Uh, how do you reconcile, like when you're interacting with people and they say something like, so you're saying Yogananda wasn't 100% truthful? How, how, do you, how do you reconcile that or help them reconcile the, the importance of autobiography of yogi, but also trying to see it in the context that you're explaining. Yeah, well, um, you know, there is this tendency to romanticize, and, this, and, and because it's uh, such a masterful work, mm -hmm. I mean, it really, it, it's, it, ha it has his, his consciousness, his juice, mm -hmm. um, that is part of that writing and part of that text. And so, the, so we have to step back and ask ourselves, what was the purpose? Mm -hmm. Why did he write this book? Well, again, if you look at the book, more than half the book is stories about other people. Mm -hmm. It's the Yogi Christ of India that was wrapped around with his story. Right. So the autobiography of him mm -hmm. becomes an introduction and becomes a trailer for mm -hmm. the center section, which is all these other individuals and the remarkable stories about them. Right. So then the question becomes, well, are the stories so remarkable that they're, you know, fantasy and totally made up? Mm -hmm. And this is where we find, uh, you know, a really, uh, it's a, a sort of an interesting challenge because many of the things that are claimed, many of these are written about and are, uh, you know, contextually available in ancient yoga texts and writings and if we really look into the to the history we find that many you know much of the history of yoga was focused around individuals that were trying to acquire these powers mm -hmm. they were trying to be supermen ah, and women okay they, and so if you go back and you look and you say wow you know were these individuals motivated to go and become God conscious? Right. Not so much. Right. More motivated to become powerful, to become immortal, to become, you know, to, to be able to be somebody, you know, huh. in the universe. And so much of much of what we see these renunciates uh -huh. uh, were focused on was, you know, things that were more mundane. Mm -hmm. But but in the you know, but the the kind of the the joke of the whole thing is in order to acquire these powers you have to let go of the desire <laughs> right you know so it's a catch-22 uh -huh. so when you get really involved the, the more you get involved you know the more it, you become engrossed in the process and the process takes over and then it becomes transformative and 
So it's very interesting, you know. So in a way, that's interesting. So in a way, it's when we see autobiography of a yogi and these stories of these individuals with powers, and obviously that is a draw to many people. So that is a way to kind of, it's like the bait. <laughs> and then once they get into it and they start to recognize like you said you have to let go of that false sense of self and then maybe more than likely you don't really care about the powers anymore well maybe the thing is that that <laughs> in order to have the power you have to let go of the desire to want the power right mm-hmm. so this is what Patanjali says in the third chapter of the cities mm-hmm. he says well here's all the things that are possible and then, and then right after that, he says, but you can't do that. <laughs> right. See? right. I mean, this is not why we practice, because if, you, if that's why you're practicing and that's where your focus is, it becomes a trap. Uh-huh. And so then you're stuck, you're, you're addicted to another uh, set of ideas and attitudes that are also limiting. Mm-hmm. So, so it's, you know, there's this interesting process where we are baited right you know we are attracted uh to what is the best for us for one reason and as we get involved with it we find out that it's much deeper and much more profound and much different than what we thought Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well that that puts a whole different spin on things um because studying the yoga sutras whenever i would get to that third chapter on the cities i would always stop thinking to myself (laughs) why is this what why do they even talk about it <laughs> if it says what you said at the end, you know, that, but this is not the reason you do it. So that's, um, it reminds me of a story in Basista's Yoga. I don't remember the exact one, but it's a story of these individuals that go out into the woods looking for firewood. They think they're looking for firewood, but they end up finding like the gem of wisdom. So it seems like it's a similar kind of thread throughout maybe yogic literature to kind of work that way. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay. It's hard to make peace with, though, because when you want to just get down to reality. Well, <laughs> yeah, but to, see, that's, that, that's the problem. When you want to just get down to reality, like there's something to get to. <laughs> I see. It's, you know, the, the, the whole in, inside joke is that you're already it. You're right. already there. Whatever you're looking for, you carry around with you. Mm-hmm. Um, and all the... All the processes and techniques and all of the running around that we do uh, is is kind of chasing our tail. You know, <laughs> the reality is that the waking up is oh, it's you know, I'm I'm watching this happen. I'm watching myself think. I'm watching myself make these decisions. I'm watching, and what is it that's the eye that's doing the watching? You right. See? right. So this so we we. So we're constantly, we work really hard to come back to this awareness, this, uh, this understanding that we are already it. Mm-hmm. Right. When I, when I think about that, um, you know, there are a lot of, I've only gone to a few of these talks, but like non-dualist teachers that seem to have a sentiment like you don't have to do anything. You just, you know, you, you take that idea of you are it and then that's it. When this is something I've thought about a lot, when it seems that practicing meditation and uh, the Kriya Pranayama practices, that this gives maybe, hmm, it seems like maybe it reveals it with more clarity, or uh, because if you tell someone that, that, that that's it, and they're, say, anxious or depressed or not a happy person, then they sit around just kind of thinking, well, this must be it. So the processes themselves, do they just give you an excuse to recognize that it is it? Like, how, how does that? No, they're actually, and it's, and it's amazing to me that, um, that these yogis figured this stuff out so long ago. Uh-huh. This, is, this is transformative. Uh-huh. This, is, this is rewiring your brain and your nervous system uh-huh. through practice. If you do anything that you do with repetition, the brain is a very efficient organ in it, so it it um, it works to simplify and to make automatic hmm. whatever you do with repetition. So you can tie your shoe without even thinking about it. Mm-hmm. But if you had to write down how you tie your shoe, 
which string do you put on top? How do you make the loop? I mean, just describe it in detail. You got to really think about it. Mm-hmm. So you know how to do it, but do you? you know? <laughs> and so, so this process of of uh, practice that we do is rewiring the brain to make it easier, to make it automatic for us to come into these states of awareness. Okay these places where we are, can be conscious and bright, not thinking, but just to be aware. Mm-hmm. And that, and normally, Mr. Davis would say, well, normal, ordinary consciousness is blurred, fragmented. Um, you know, we have these neural networks, millions of neural networks, 100 billion neurons and 10,000 connections with each one. So each neuron could have can be in a network with 10,000 other. I mean, can be in 10,000 networks. So we have these millions of networks, and each network is responsible for some of them are taking care of the body. Some of them are thoughts, mm-hmm. concepts, ideas, and they're all firing all the time. Mm-hmm. The whole this whole system is always on, hundred percent, twenty four seven, and some of these become energized to the place where they they pop up to the surface, and we notice them. We become conscious of these networks firing, so we have these thoughts. But one thought comes, and then another, and this one leads to that triggers all this free association. So all this stuff is just going on, and we're fragmented, blurred, not focused. Mm-hmm. So what happens when we practice is we rewire the system so that it can focus, Mm -hmm. so it can stay on track, can stay one-pointed, can process these higher, if you will, states of consciousness, Mm -hmm. these more expanded states of consciousness more easily. So yeah, these practices are very practical. Mm -hmm. When I've thought about it, what you're saying makes a lot of sense. I've, I've thought about it in the way of it being like a fine-tuning like a radio antenna. You know, instead of being in the between stations where you've got a little bit of static and a little bit of someone talking here, you're actually training the nervous system to just dial right in to that one clear you know, mode of... of mm-hmm. so is, that, is that similar to what you're... Yeah, as we do this, as we do this again and again, um, we're able to be... Uh, more adept at uh, disregarding the things that are not useful, right? Disregarding the the places that the, the, the networks that are firing that um, are not appropriate for the for our purpose at the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So okay. yeah, that changes, and we also have that that same tuning, fine tuning, is happening from outside of us. Mm-hmm. So the, the universe is wired up to be supportive and nurturing. Everything is, is uh, unfolding out of itself, mm-hmm. is emerging, blossoming. This expressive reality is expressing in this organic, unfolding manner. And it has an innate intelligence, and it has innate order. And part of the intelligence and the order of that is constantly bringing us trying to get us to stay on that narrow track, Hmm. to stay focused on what our purpose is and where we can thrive. And so what happens is the tuning mechanism is suffering. Hmm. So when we start to suffer, this this is an indication that, oh, we've drifted off into some unknown territory. This is not part of our path. And as we come back and as we get closer and closer to center, we find things work. Mm-hmm. Things just fall into place. That are we're taken care of, nurtured, supported, magical, and then we go off track and we start to suffer. Mm-hmm. So we have this mechanism. It is constantly bringing us back to this center that is our optimum pl- place for our experience for us as individuals. Mm-hmm. So it's a self-directing, self-correcting process if we move with it if we allow it to. And the meditation procedures and processes give us the capacity to recognize that more easily? Well, the, without having to have the, you know, grosser form of getting beat down suffering. <laughs> well, meditation practice does two things. Number one is it uh, allows us to have the experience of what we are. Mm-hmm. So you can have this experience of being. Mm-hmm. 
conscious, aware, bright, with no thought. No past, no future, no expectation, no, you know, no memory. Everything is just being in this moment. So we have that experience. So that's part of it, and that's transformative. <coughs> And then from and then the, the other part in order to have that is that we are become more and more adept at focusing our attention, mm -hmm. so we can keep our attention on what we're about. Mm -hmm. We stay on purpose, stay on track, and not be uh, distracted so easily. Mm -hmm. And when we're able to focus our attention, then we're able to see more clearly what is useful for us and avoid the things that are not useful and we develop the discipline to be able to follow through with that. Right. I see. So so this, you know, so these things are are, are the practical aspects of what we're doing, our meditation. Mm -hmm. So we are focus we're able to focus attention, we're able to know from experience that we are this consciousness that is involved with, you know, playing this role, having this adventure, but not not the role, right. not the adventure. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Well, that's a lot to think about. <laughs> Let's get back to to the the project that you were working on. Um, so you mentioned about how uh, Lahiri and uh, Babaji met. Mm -hmm. um, so then this project isn't specifically focused on Yogananda. This is about the lineage itself. Is that correct? Yeah. So when we started, when I came back and I started to try to write the script for the pilgrimage, mm -hmm. I kept thinking, well, I can't tell, I can't, how can I explain about Yogananda's life without talking about Sri Yukteswar mm -hmm. and Lahiri Mahashaya and Babaji, and who were those people? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so this project evolved from a pilgrimage into a biography of our guru lineage. Okay. So what about Sri Yukteswar? Is there anything in particular other than you know what we know from autobiography of a yogi that you found particularly interesting about his life or him but as a teacher. He, yeah, lot, lots, t tons of things. It's really, really remarkable. Um, one thing is his name, Sri Yukteswar, is not Sri Yukteswar. Mm -hmm. Sri is a, is a you know means bright, uh, radiant, is, a, is actually a shortened uh, form of Lakshmi. Hmm. Um, and so Shri is, a, is something that we put in front of someone's name as an honorific, uh, normally. But Shri of Teswar, before he became, before he took the, the vows and became a Swami, uh, his name was Priyanat Karar. And for quite a while, he was he called himself Priyanat Karar Swami. He wasn't a Swami yet, but this was, this was how he referred to himself after he had met this um, this brilliant sage in the Kumbha Mela who had referred to him. Said, "Swami, come here, come here." And so after that, he said, "He said, I'm not a Swami." So Swami the person said, "Yeah, yeah, okay." So after that, Priyanat would. Uh, would refer to himself as Priyanat Karar Swami. Okay. So, and and so uh, when he did his uh, programs, when he would have his seminars and lectures, and he he did this, uh, Lahiri Mahashaya did not. Mm -hmm. um, Lahiri was uh, Lahiri Baba. He he wasn't Lahiri Mahashaya. Um, that was that name came afterwards. He would they referred to him as Lahiri Baba mm -hmm. or Kashi Baba. Kashi is the ancient name for Benares, okay. for uh, Varanasi. So, um, and so um, Yukteswar would have um, seminars and programs, and he was a uh, also a Vedic astrologer and and, and had, was had studied uh, Ayurveda and many things. He was really a very bright guy. Um, so whenever he would have his programs, he would address the people that came to his programs as Sri Yukta. Yukta is, is uh, identified, yoked with ultimate reality. So so you basically, instead of saying Mr. So-and-so, Mrs. So-and-so, you would say Sri Yukta. You're a bright, radiant spirit, one with all. Hmm. He said that to them. To them. Okay. He would call, you know, he would say Sri Yukta or Sri Yukti if it was a woman. Mm -hmm. 
Shri Yukta or Shri Yukti. So this is how he talked to people. Mm -hmm. This is how he referred to them. So when he became a Swami, the name he was given was Shri Yukta Ishwar. Mm -hmm. This is Ishvara is uh, the ultimate reality. Mm -hmm. uh, so so his name is Shri Yukteswar, one word, not Shri Yukteswar, two words. Okay, I did not know that. <laughs> most people don't know. That. So, so these are the. I mean, there's lots of stories. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Lots of stories. So when after you've gone through this process of you know, doing the pilgrimage and learning these different things about the um, the Kriya Yoga lineage, uh, how did that impact your understanding of the lineage, or how did that impact your understanding of this path? Did it change it at all, or give you any other kind of insights? Well, I had the. I had the insight in the beginning. I mean, my one of the objectives of the movie was uh, I asked myself, how did Yogananda become Yogananda? Mm -hmm. How did how does somebody become a great saint like this? How does that work? Mm -hmm. You know, what's happening? And so, in the process of researching and learning more about his life, his in his youth, uh, but also our guru lineage. Um, we find out that that these individuals were real people. Mm -hmm. They actually were real people who had challenges and difficulties and obstacles to overcome, and who worked very hard. And so, for me, it was it was very empowering. Mm -hmm. And I think it was, and this is one of the reasons that we took this project on, was uh, that I think it's empowering, and I think people need to know and have a relationship with these individuals as masters, not avatars, but masters. And being a master means that you have done the work and mastered whatever the subject or the topic that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And so each of these individuals demonstrated mastery. Uh, we don't know, we don't know anything really about Babaji. Mm -hmm. Uh, very, very little. There the stories and rumors, and you know, it's it's very, very hard to pin any of these things down. But Lahiri Baba and Priyanath Karar and Mukunda uh, Yogananda, all of these fellows, they were contemporaries, and there were people who wrote about them, and they they have descendants or disciples, and so uh, we know much more about them, and and I think. Uh, having people understand and know what their process and their path was um, can be very empowering for folks that say, well, you know, I, it, it's, it's easy to talk about these things, but these are masters, and how could I ever possibly hope to be like that? Well, you can hope to be like that because they did it. Right. You know? So in a way, seeing them as, as humans who went through the human experience, but also was they were able to master their hu human nature or their human consciousness such that they were able to process these higher states. And by seeing that, the idea is that then maybe other people recognize that, hey, you can do it too, right? Okay. Right. Which, is, which is what they all say. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, they all say, you can do it too, but we think, well, it's easy for you to say, you know. Uh, but I remember Roy, it's actually in one of the videos we have, where he said, uh, someone had asked Yogananda once, he said, um, Master, it's easy, for, um, it's easy for you to do these things because you're a master, but it's hard for us. <laughs> and Yogananda said, how do you think I got to be like this? Right. Mm -hmm. so, how do you think this... And so it's, I think it's important to have that understanding that you know, if you do the work, if you're willing to show up and do the work, mm -hmm. um, the res the results, the reward will come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, um, do you want to talk about the projected date you have to release this, or should we save it and then I can put it in the liner notes of this uh, of this talk? Yeah, the pl at my pl at this point, my plan is uh, this is 2019 in in the fall, and my plan is to be is to have this out in the spring, spring or by the, certainly by the summer of next year. Okay. Okay. Um, and will be available. How will it be available? That's okay. Well, I'll I'll start off. I'll have some DVDs made, but the world is moving very much in the direction of streaming. Mm -hmm. So, 
so I, I have a couple of possible uh, streaming services that will be available in this way. People all over the world have access to it instantly. Right. So, um, so we have a website, becomingyogananda.com, and it has hundreds and hundreds of pictures of all the places in the autobiography of a yogi, you know, all the places that we went on our pilgrimage, uh, some videos. There's actually a video on there that's a, a kind of the pilgrimage video. It's not not the one that I would have made, but we just did a presentation and said, here was our trip. Right. Kind of, this was this is what India looks like, and here's traveling to this place and what we encountered. And so, uh, so that's a good presentation. That's something folks can look at. Okay. Um, but we will, and so we'll announce it there. And on, we have a becoming yoga on the Facebook page and okay. and uh, uh, email list that we'll be announcing it. And so that will be happening next spring. Okay, so next spring, and then um, at other times you're leading the uh, the seminars and sessions here at CSA. Mm -hmm. And um, that happens two times a month throughout, or is it every week throughout the summertime? The first two weeks of each month. First, starting in, in April. In April, okay. And then we have, uh, and that goes from April through September, and then we have uh, a weekend in October, a weekend in November, and then the first Saturday in December is the Holy Season Meditation. We have a three-hour meditation for that. Okay. And then besides that, I'm, I'm also traveling. I've got, uh, we have a seminar in Atlanta that we'll be doing in October, late October. And then I'm, I'll be in Italy next spring for a retreat in Italy and working with the folks there. And so okay. things continue to unfold. Right. And for more information on that, people can go to um, csa-davis.org, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well... Thank you so much for taking the time to talk about us. I really appreciate it. Good. Yeah. All right. Thank Thanks. you. Good seeing you. Appreciate it.